This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Paladin I swear, the young squire begins, clutching the symbol of Bahamut to his heart, to protect the weak and the defenseless, to fight for the welfare of all, to bring honor to my brothers and to the temple of Bahamut, to eschew pride, greed, and falsehood, to speak the truth at all times, to never refuse a challenge from an equal, and to never let a foe see my back. The elder knight steps toward the kneeling squire and takes the young man's hand, still holding the symbol of the platinum dragon. With a quick flash of his ceremonial dagger, the knight opens a gash on the back of the squire's hand. With your blood, this oath is sealed, intones the knight. Arise now, paladin, and let none question your faith. Folks in the know recognize the name Paladin as having historical origins. But the Paladin in D&D isn't as closely related to the historical Paladin as people think. In point of fact, the D&D Paladin has as much to do with King Charlemagne as the video game Dante's Inferno has to do with the actual Bible. That is to say, the D&D Paladin is actually a couple of steps removed from the historical source material. Let's begin at the beginning. The story of the paladin sort of begins with a guy named Charles or Carl. Well, technically, the story really begins with a guy named Pippin the Short. But I'm not talking about a particular Turkish midget who once helped walk an evil ring across New Zealand and throw it into a volcano. I'm talking about a Frankish king, King Pippin the Short. The trouble is, by the time King Pippin put his booster seat on the throne of the Frankish kingdom, there had been about 500 years of chaotic European history setting the stage for what was going to happen. And we could spend all day discussing what is generally called the early Dark Ages that run from 300 CE to 750 CE and not even scratch the surface. In a nutshell, Rome collapsed and Rome had unified Western, Central, and Southern Europe and North Africa. Though we have to put unified in some big quotation marks, because unification through conquest was Rome's deal. But Rome started to have problems, big problems. First of all, you had all these tribes called the Germanic tribes. They had the run of most of the rest of Central Europe and they were kind of tired of Rome pushing into their territory. So they started fighting back, and eventually the Romans were forced to give up the lands of Germania, which included portions of what we now call France and Belgium. Now, the Germanic tribes weren't exactly unified peoples themselves. They were tribes, after all. You had Ostrogoths, Visigoths, and you had Franks, among many many others. And the Germanic tribes were having problems of their own. See, a group of invaders had come from the east. You might have heard of them. They were called the Huns. And the Germanic tribes were caught between a Rome that was suffering all sorts of economic and political problems and these invaders. Meanwhile, the Roman emperor decided that the Roman Empire was just too damn big to rule. So Theodosius, split the empire between his two sons, Honorius and Arcadius. Eastern Rome became the Byzantine Empire under Constantine, while Western Rome, the Holy Roman Empire, utterly falls apart. See, as the Germanic tribes get shoved around by the Huns, they drive the Romans out of many areas. The Romans lose Hispania and most of Italy. At the same time, they are forced to retreat from Britannia, leaving it in the hands of the Angles, the Saxons, the Jutes, the Gauls, and the Picts, and so on. Now, the Byzantine Empire managed to do pretty well for a while controlling Greece, Turkey, North Africa, and Spain. But as the Byzantine Empire declined, the newly unified Muslims started spreading from the Middle East across northern Africa and eventually into Spain. Meanwhile, in the center of Europe, across modern-day France, Belgium, and parts of Germany, the Frankish kingdom 
starts to flourish. First came Charles Martel, and he unified and expanded the Frankish Empire, driving the Muslims back a bit into Spain and beginning to unify the Germanic tribes under Frankish rule. Under Martel's son, Pippin, more Germanic tribes were absorbed into the Frankish Empire, and ultimately, Pippin has a son, Charles the Great, Charles the Magnificent, Charlemagne. Charlemagne was a peerless military leader and a ruthless general. His dream was to unite all of Europe under the rule of the Franks, and he spent 30 years conquering Europe. And, despite his ruthlessness, he was extremely progressive in a lot of ways. He supported education across his kingdom. He also instituted standards for trade, currency, and measurement. In fact, some scholars credit him for inventing the idea of modern education, and several famous future conquerors of all of Europe admitted that they drew inspiration from Charlemagne. These included Napoleon Bonaparte and Adolf Hitler. Charlemagne was also a devout Christian, and he spread Christianity throughout his kingdom. And when Pope Leo III was driven out of Rome by a rebellion, Charlemagne went down there, put down the rebellion, and put the Pope back where he belonged. Thus, he also gained the crown of the Holy Roman Empire. For all of that, Charlemagne was ruthless. Many of his policies were brutally oppressive, and he forced Christianity on basically everyone that stood still long enough, often under the threat of death. He was a zealous crusader. And you might think this is where the paladin thing comes from. And you'd be wrong, because the paladins are almost certainly fictional. According to a number of stories, Charlemagne had a vassal named Roland, and Roland had eleven buddies, and these twelve peers of Charlemagne were his greatest warriors and led his armies and fought the Saracens across Europe, the European Muslims. And while Roland may have actually been a real historical figure, the Twelve Peers weren't mentioned in literature until the 11th century in a story called The Song of Roland. Now these Twelve Peers eventually got the name Paladins, and the name derives from the Latin name Palatinus. Palatinus means person who works on Palatine Hill, where the palace of the Emperor of Rome was located. It basically meant loyal government official, or buddy of the emperor. But the thing was, the paladins were just generals. They led Charlemagne's armies and fought the Saracens, in fictional stories. It wasn't until the 16th century that the paladins started to become romantic figures, and that was due primarily to the influence of two Italian Renaissance authors, Matteo Maria Boiardo, and Ludovico Ariosto, who rewrote and greatly expanded on the stories of the Twelve Peers in much the same way that Victorian writers rewrote the stories of King Arthur and his knights in the 1800s. Speaking of romantic notions, let's talk about chivalry, because we often associate the paladins with medieval knights, and we associate medieval knights with chivalry. If you want to get technical, though, the paladins probably didn't follow the code of chivalry, because the code of chivalry didn't come into being until the 1100s, and also because the paladins were fictional characters. That said, the code of chivalry and the paladins actually started in sort of the same place, and they got romanticized in the same place, the 1800s. Chivalry comes from the same root as the word cavalry, and also cavalier. In fact, the term started with the word chevalier. Chevalier was a French word that simply meant someone who had enough training and money so that he could, in times of war, come up with a horse, armor, and a lance. That's all it meant. That would be like if the modern word pilot meant someone who owns his own jet fighter and knows how to fly it. The thing was, it was extremely expensive to own a war horse, and armor, 
and a lance and a sword. And it was also extremely time consuming to learn how to use all of those things. And the average peasant couldn't waste the time on training and couldn't raise a fraction of the money needed. So chevaliers were almost exclusively members of the aristocracy. It wasn't until the 12th century that chivalry became a code of ethics, and the basic medieval framework for chivalry included three broad concepts. Courtesy, which meant having good manners appropriate to a king's court. Reciprocity, which meant doing to others as they did to you. And honor, which meant maintaining your good reputation and public status. But things kept getting piled onto the concept of chivalry. By the end of the 13th century, the code of chivalry had become very complex. According to the 13th century writer and theologian Raymond Lull, knights became knights to do what was right and just. And they must be able-bodied, have good lineage, be wealthy enough to be a knight, be wise, be generous, be loyal, be courageous, be honorable, to defend the Christian faith, defend his king, protect women and children, exercise constantly, hunt, perform in tournaments, supervise the work of the peasants, chase down robbers and evildoers, avoid pride, avoid lechery, avoid falsehood, and never betray his lord. <sighs> that was a lot. Now, recently, some have claimed that chivalry has been greatly misrepresented as a romantic notion. But writings from the time period actually indicate that the code of chivalry, as an ethical code, was very complex and nuanced, and also that the idea of the gentleman knight was not far off the mark. At the very least, that was the ideal. That said, chivalric codes varied from place to place, and knight's obedience of those codes also varied because knights were human beings. But we do know that chivalry did mutate a great deal. From the 13th century on to about the 16th century, chivalry continued to expand and to grow, but it also changed. As time went on, it became more focused on spectacle, according to some historians. Chivalric knights became the Kardashians of their day, or the Lady Gagas, or the PewDiePies. They became, as some historians put it, exhibitionist and extravagant often to the point of vulgarity. Tournaments and knightly orders became all about ritual and performance and about the ego of the aristocracy. And they also became a sign of the growing economic divide between the aristocracy and the working classes. But none of that has anything to do with the paladin in D&D. The paladin in D&D actually comes from the same place that the first alignment system came from in D&D appropriately enough. Both Paladins and the division between Law and Chaos came from a single book, Three Hearts and Three Lions by Poole Anderson. It was published in 1961, and it was a favorite of Gary Gygax. In the book, a Danish engineer is shot during World War II while trying to protect a Swedish scientist. Instead of transporting his blood and guts out of his body, the gunshot instead transports the engineer to a magical alternate history Europe based on a fictional account of Charlemagne's conquest of Europe. In this book, the world is divided into two realms. The first is the realm of law, which is currently locked in war between the Holy Roman Empire led by King Charlemagne and the Saracens. The other world is the chaotic world of supernatural creatures. The engineer becomes a knight, a paladin, teams up with a magical swan lady and a dwarf, and they get captured by elves and meet Morgan Le Fay and a werewolf and dragons, and they find Excalibur, and eventually the engineer escapes back into the real world to help America invent the atomic bomb. I kid you not. The whole book is basically a giant pile of every medieval fantasy influence you can imagine. Every European mythology is represented, Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court is referenced. Tolkien is referenced. Shakespeare. It's all in there. It's basically the biggest fantasy mishmash that existed until Richard Lord British Garriott wrote Time Lords, Space Shuttles, Dragon Turtles, Orcs, and Phasers into Ultima One. And 
how do we know that this book influenced D&D? Well, apart from the explicit law chaos divide and the romantic view of the paladin of Charlemagne as a chivalrous knight, the book also featured regenerating trolls. Yep, you heard me right. Paladins in D&D come from the same place as the concept of a world divided between law and chaos and the idea that trolls grow back lost body parts. So, how can you use this all in your game? Well, obviously, paladins are already there. But the definition of a paladin in D&D has sort of gotten watered down. Until 3rd edition, they were lawful good holy knights. They followed the gods, sure, but they didn't necessarily follow a specific god. They followed a complex code that included faith to the gods, much like the medieval chivalrous knight that had a complex code that included Christianity. And that's important, because D&D already includes divine soldiers, empowered by the gods to serve their will in the world. That's the role of a cleric. A paladin was something special, something different, not just another divine spellcaster with martial skill, and that is important. So even though alignment restrictions were lifted in 4e, and every deity could have paladins, maybe you should think a little bit about what, in the story of the game world, makes a paladin different from a cleric. I don't mean just in terms of different mechanical abilities, but what is the role of the paladin in the world, and how do people tell paladins from clerics? And why does the world include both? This has been the GM Word of the Week. It was written by the Angry GM and recorded and produced by me, Fiddleback. You can find more at theangrygm.com and madadventurers.com